the story um, I will tell you happened on the Yom Kippur War of 1973. Israel was taken by surprise. <coughs> Syria and Egypt's attacking armies broke our lines on both fronts. Our Minister of Defense, Moshe Dayan, believed at that time that we were losing the Third Temple, Israel. Then our government ordered the Israeli Air Force to bomb and demolish the Syrian headquarters in the middle of Damascus, their Pentagon, as a strategic blow and a strategic warning to the Syrians and Egyptians that enough is enough. This is the point. For that mission was selected a formation of eight F-4 Phantom aircrafts carrying 30 tons of bombs and led by a lieutenant colonel. Following is the report of the leader, quote, We just landed after attacking an Egyptian airfield halfway between Cairo and the Gulf of Suez. A new mission was waiting for us the Syrian headquarters in the center of Damascus. The time for, pre for preparation was short, but it was necessary to prepare well. The air defense array around Damascus was formidable. Ten missile batteries surrounded the city. Flying in there at high altitude was totally out of question. But they gave us an excellent route to the target over a mountainous and forested area in Lebanon. This way we could fly low into Damascus under the missile radars. Then we would burst out of the wadi and appear over them all of a sudden, taking the anti-aircraft by surprise. I gave my crews a short briefing, emphasizing the importance of flying very low, right until the last moment. Used, used the land for protection, I told my pilot seriously, and added just another order, aim carefully this time. This is a city. Don't scatter your bombs. Hit the point. We took off and went out to sea. The morning was blue and beautiful. It's written in the report. Continue. <laughs> Approaching Lebanon's coast, the, the tops of Lebanon's mountains rose over the horizon. Now I could see that clouds were heaped up over the mountain crests. The clouds were large the tops white and shining in the sun, while their bottoms were dark, covering the mountain tops. The view was stunning. We thundered over the beach and began climbing the mountain slope to cross the first barrier on our way. In Lebanon, there are two lines of mountains with a valley. After that, Damascus. The atmosphere around us changed instantly into the dark of winter. I pointed my nose between two high peaks. The air was brighter in there. My phantom squeezed heavily into it, turning. And the other seven slid in behind me. Mountain tops passed over our heads on both sides, disappearing in the gray cloud cover above. <coughs> we passed that summit, and the ground dropped away below us, 
And on the other side of the valley towered the next chain, the anti-Lebanon anti mountains. It also had its tops in the clouds. Again, full power, nose up, and the phantoms began climbing the slope. Again, I was searching for a break between the mountain tops and the cloud ceiling. This time, it was seven times more important since the, beyond this chain was the enemy. The aircraft gained altitude and the clouds were already closed and no break to be seen. The steep climb bled our airspeed and the Phantom felt tired and heavy, its string clumsy. I pressed my aircraft to the ground in order to gain some seconds more before I hit the clouds. Trees passed by my wings. Seven heavy phantoms loaded with fuel, bombs, and 14 air crews dragged behind me. A few hundred meters ahead of me, the cloud merged with the mountain into one foggy amorphous mess. There was no brightening whatsoever that might signal a break. If I didn't decide soon, the mountain would decide for me. I decided. Lighting both afterburners, I broke radio silence and shouted, everybody climb full power above the clouds. And immediately I pulled up with what speed I had left. Instantly, my aircraft cockpit was shrouded in humid, opaque cotton wool. The climb went on and on. Did I make the decision to pull up in time? Did all of them hear and pull up immediately? At long last, the light around us began to flicker, and all of a sudden, our phantom broke out of the clouds. Gasping, I and the navigator found ourselves hanging at 12,000 feet over a white, brilliant cloud carpet that went all the way east where Damascus waited. Our heads turned in search for the rest of the formation. One by one and two by two black phantoms popped out of the white, wavy rug. I lowered the wing and began to collect them all and organize them again into combat formation, but the situation had changed. There were no holes in the clouds below. I was disconnected from the ground. And meanwhile, a warning light began flashing, and I heard a chirp in my earphones. <coughs> Our warning gear told us that Damascus missile radars had already acquired us. The batteries were tracking us through the clouds. I did not know what to do. It made no sense to continue at altitude to push eight aircraft above the clouds right over a locked-on missile array. The missiles would burst out at full speed from the clouds leaving us no time to react. How many phantoms would survive the first salvo? I didn't know. Then, maybe plunge head down into the clouds and to the ground again? No, this would be insanity. I could bang eight phantoms to the rocks, eliminating whole fighting units from our order of battle at that time. No. I heard my own voice talking on the radio. Cool and businesslike. Formation, turn 180, we are going back west. End of citation from a report in the book. This was the sorry end of one of the most important missions planned almost perfectly, considering almost every aspect but one, the weather on the way, 
and above the target. If not for the decision taking at that point, the end could have been even more tragic. Now, <coughs> some things for me. Of course, the situation changed since 1973. The advance in forecasting and now casting. And the advance in, excuse me, and the advance in instrumentation of aircraft happened concurrently and changed, changed the situation and the fiasco over the mountain and clouds before Damascus uh, could have been um, stopped at our time either by good forecasting and if not by flying instrumentation through clouds. So we can see a quantum jump by knowledge of the world in only 40 years, knowledge of the world, atmosphere, and technology. I want to address myself to this. After 45 years as active combat pilot and the client of this community, I have to tell you that my appreciation to this science, atmospheric science, comes mainly from it being applicative, operational, and useful science. I know that um, almost every science bring at the end useful results. But as Louis Occellini said yesterday, sometimes this takes a long time. And we need applicative science. And here I mean not only forecasting, not only we have to find ways to influence the situation of things in the world. It's not enough to get ready to disasters. You have to, we have to find also ways to prevent them. And if this is impossible, at least intervene into them and minimize the results. Now, the changes in the environment, in society, in policy, are accumulating into quantum jumps that we can see all around us. 20 years ago and today are different times. And the tomorrow will be also different. Quantum jumping is, is what is happening around us. And so, with, with our problems, which affect life on Earth and us, the drivers that affect us are our population, human population, standard of living, and lack of resources. And they are all connected, interconnected, in the culture we developed and live in it. I believe that the situation of the world, where it is going, and the development of that technology so fast, must lead us to emphasize applicative operational sciences. We have to direct our centers of wisdom towards the questions of population, overpopulation, standard of living, what can we do and what we cannot, and limitation of resources to open limitations as much as we can by science, and we have to focus on the next 50 years to come. The products of such emphasis shall be for the benefit 
of our students, our universities, our society, and the world at large, not only we human. In short, I'm saying we have to emphasize applications at this crucial time. And in order to finish uh, this lecture with a bit of humor, I'll tell you another story, and this is, will be the end. An incident that happened in the attack on the nuclear reactor on Baghdad, and that will show you that even, not only meteorology, even geophysics or even astronomy can be applicative. <clears throat> Baghdad lies a, a thousand kilometers on the east from here. That takes more than two hours each way by an F-16. We were um, planned to do it with F-16, again eight aircraft, 30 tons of bombs, and go demolish this nuclear, Saddam's nuclear reactor, but the fuel was almost not sufficient. It was difficult to go, to go back and get with fuel. So we planned to go back by night, go there by day, go back by night. The, at night, you are less exposed. You can fly low and conserve fuel. So the moment of attack was dawn, the sunset. Then after the, you finish your bomb the target, we go back home at night after the sunset. We did attack on time. And when we turned back, we were amazed to see that the sun was setting and setting and setting, and setting. All the two and a half hours back home, the sun was setting. <laughs> With us, we were in full light. Because everybody here understands this is geophysics or astronomy. And at this time, luck covered for unproficiency in geophysics. But gentlemen and ladies, luck will not cover for us every day, and we have to intervene in what's happening to the world. Thank you.